talk about what we're actually doing in in the clinical practice that's available right now for uh, aging interventions. And one thing one thing we do differently is we we take a very systems based approach. We've been doing this for about the past six or so years, where we're looking at many biomarkers uh, in our clients. So we get um, molecular markers, biochemical, genetic, epigenetic, transcriptomic, metabolomic, proteomic, you know, environmental, psychological, social, even spiritual. And this is this is a way to consider the systems-based approach. This was the Foresight Institute's um, obesity map that they did back in, I think it was 2007. And you can see all of the interactions of the, the different um, areas that contribute to the core thing that they were looking at, which was energy balance. Um, this was a beautiful map and it was designed to uh, disrupt the obesity epidemic in the UK, but uh, policymakers couldn't understand it very well. And that's been one of the issues with systems uh, approaches. So the way we've been doing it, um, you know, we get full genomic sequencing now, we get brain EEGs, we assess the autonomic nervous system through HRV, breath mechanics, expired CO2, posture and gait analysis, microbiomes, um, environmental exposures. And what we try to do is create uh, context for each of our clients. We get quality of life inventories, ethical and spiritual values, geopolitical uh, leanings, meaning and purpose in their life. We do the cancer screens. We do skin and retinal scanning, glycans, epigenetics, metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, full body MRIs. And uh, recently we've added things like the coronary CT angiogram with clearly analysis to look at soft plaques. And we're working on an IRB with uh, Caristo Health out of London for the carry heart, which looks at inflammation around the blood vessels from this same scan that uh, clearly uses and the same one that you get with a coronary CT angiogram. Um, we're working on an IRB with uh, Sage Signal, which is an at-home test that will determine uh, inflammation levels in the brain. Uh, Sapir X, a uh, new one that I love, and I think Natalia has been on the, on the show talking about it, uh, looking at cellular and immune senescence tests. And one of the things we're finding is that a lot of the uh, biologic age tests that use surrogates, they use proxies, uh, are being, they're coming back very different from the immune aging that we're seeing with Sapir X, which is more direct tests. So we're, we're interested in how that compares. And we're collecting uh, wearable data, uh, the biometrics, and keeping all of this data in, in a large database. So I'm going to transition. I wanted to give you that background into the way we approach things, but I want to talk about the therapies that we've been doing in the clinic. Some of these here in the United States, some of these um, in a, a, a special economic zone off of Honduras at, on an island called Roatan, uh, which is um, fast growing in the longevity space. Uh, we do plasma dilution therapies. We do young plasma exchange. Um, this is using 18 to 24 year olds to um, replace plasma in individuals. We're doing plasma gene therapies uh, using statin uh, and getting ready to start doing uh, Clotho. We're involved in some early access programs from uh, the F FDA with Galactin-3 antibodies. And so let's talk about some of these. Uh, the, the old plasma, I mean, we're talking about age accelerating chronokines in there. We're talking about inflammatory proteins, SS, SASPs, cellular waste products, misfolded proteins, and other uh, uh, progeronic factors. In the, the Convoy Labs at Stanford uh, did most of the uh, early research on this and uh, still continue to do that. But in their paper, they found uh, the results of biological age are strongly supported by the data 
demonstrates that rounds of therapeutic plasma exchange produce global shifts to a younger systemic proteome. And this has been this has been fairly consistent. I mean, young plasma is uh, fairly well established as a uh, bit of a I, I won't say youthening, but um, rejuvenating for sure approach. And when we talk about this, you know, we have in, in the old and young, we have in the old progeronic factors and in the young, we have youth factors. So there's a big change in um, what we're seeing in the plasma in, in these uh, two groups. And so that's what prompted really looking at, okay, well, what if we take off all of these progeronic um, factors in the plasma, but then we replace it with plasma from a young person, uh, specifically the 18 to 24 year olds in the study we're involved in. And the reason for that is um, those are individuals that tend to donate uh, blood to plasma centers. And it's almost, it's almost like they're at the peak of their uh, physiologic health. This is a point where they're uh, at the peak reproductive years. So all of their, um, their different substances in the plasma are really generating peak health in the individual. There was a lot of um, interest in this uh, when Catcher uh, published uh, studies talking about his E5, where he was injecting old rats with this magical substance called E5. Um, turns out this was basically exosomes from uh, the young plasma, and it was actually uh, porcine um, exosomes, young porcine. And it was rejuvenating, uh, rejuvenating these rats. And this is essentially what we're doing with the young plasma. So the composition of young, fresh frozen plasma that we get from the 18 to 24 year olds, there's 1.86 billion exosomes in just one milliliter of this stuff. And we're replacing a full liter and sometimes two liters in some people. Um, a full liter, you're talking 1.86 eight, six trillion exosomes. I mean, this is enormous, but on top of that, you're also getting these supporting factors. So it's one thing to give the, the exosomes, but um, I think uh, Tony Wiscore's lab talked about um, the need for some of these um, support factors that are going to be in the blood of younger um uh, species where you need these proteins, the peptides, cytokines, uh, sex hormones, enzymes, and minerals that will support that um, more youthful uh, phenotype that you're trying to get with the, with the exosomes that are being infused. And they, this was a, uh, another paper from uh, Wiscore's lab Intriguingly, we observed an almost universal loss of gene expression with age. Aged blood reduces global gene expression and young blood restores it. Um, and I think he was working with uh, the brain capillary endothelial cells with this, and they, they noticed profound changes uh, with the young blood when this was um, transfused. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the plasmid gene therapies that uh, we're involved in, and these are early studies in this. Um, this is a company that's working with plasmids, so they're, they're taking E. coli, making the, the proteins, and specifically the follistatin protein, the follistatin 344, and they're putting this... Um, plasmid into a, with a delivery vector that is not viral. It's a, a PEI delivery vector and is a, a cationic uh, polymer and does not create an inflammatory response in the body, but delivers these plasmids to the 
cells and gets them into the nucleus and it does not incorporate into the DNA, which is, it was a real plus when they came to me and told me about this. Um, I held off on, on participating in it until they, they came back recently with a kill switch where uh, you can take uh, three, day, three days of tetracycline and it completely eliminates the, the plasmid. So it was, a, it was a safety feature that I, I really liked. And in animal studies, they found with these plasma therapies, you get increased muscle mass, 32.5% uh, increased lifespan in mice. Um, the human early human studies showed uh, excellent safety profile with this. And uh, they also noticed targeted reduction of visceral adipose tissue and decreasing chronic inflammation. Um, I actually... Uh, took this plasma therapy a little over a year ago. Um, and my results at six months were, were pretty impressive. Um, and I was a good responder to it. My lean mass went from 117 pounds to 123. Um, so basically about a three kilo increase. Um, fat mass dropped um, nine pounds. Um, visceral abdominal fat, uh, which is, it's interesting. The uh, visceral abdominal fat seems to be a really high target with the folistatin. Um, body fat percentage dropped from 22.8 to 17.8. And my average HRV increased by, by 22, which uh, was one of the most impressive things that I found uh, because I, I do monitor HRV very closely. And we're getting ready to uh, do some trials with the uh, clothoplasmid. And, you know, this is a, a bit of a holy grail for, for me because uh, um, I, I feel like clotho uh, protein, when, when in that uh, secretion state where it's a continuous low dose uh, secretion of it, um, you can, it's been associated with higher general intelligence, enhanced synaptic plasticity, neural resilience, arterial calcifications, longer lifespan, um, all of these things that are, that are so great. I mean, even improving kidney function uh, and, and heart function. So this is, uh, this is one we're excited about and uh, currently still in the lab with it, but uh, hoping to get this into a clinical trial very soon. Another one I want to mention is uh, the anti-galactin-3 antibody. This is a FDA has an early access program. So we're working with this uh, in our clinic in the U.S. Uh, using the TB006 um, for uh, dementia. And this is a, it's an interesting approach because you're talking about the beta amyloid um, monomers, forms dimers, trimers, oligomers, and the galactin-3 seems to be weaving this together and holding it in place. The, the TB006, which is the anti-galactin-3 antibody, goes in and breaks up the galactin-3 um, oligomers and allows for the clearance of the plaques. And the early studies looked really good, great safety profiles. So the FDA approved an early access program for certain clinics to um, perform this. And we currently only have one person in the trial, but uh, we're, we're seeing some, um, some cognitive improvement. Um, he's had about five monthly um, over five months, he does a one month uh, IV of this. But you look at galactin-3 and it's kind of ubiquitous in all areas of the body. I mean, it's involved in all of these brain conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, TBI, long COVID, inflammation um, in the heart, inflammation, congestive heart failure, myocardial ischemia, uh, it's involved in oncogenesis, uh, fibrosis in the, uh, uh, in the lungs and in neuropathies and in aging, senescence, immune dysregulation, and uh, tissue fibrosis. I bring this up because this brings us full circle back to what I was talking about at the beginning of looking at things from a systems approach. It's really easy to look at this and say, wow, this is an incredible intervention. I mean, if it can affect all of these different programs, 
But when you look at it from a, a systems approach, you have to consider not only these, these positive impacts on certain systems and, but also the consequences to these systems because Galactin-3 is ubiquitous and it is involved in natural healing processes. Uh, it's involved like after a heart attack, it, you, it causes more fibrosis, but blocking it may not be the right thing to do after a heart attack. So we're not really sure of the nuances of this and how will using it to treat the brain impact other areas of the body in this systems-based approach of, of these individuals. So it's real easy to, to latch on to all of these positive findings with this. Um, I actually saw a recent study that talked about Clotho that there was a bit of a U-shaped curve on, um, on cancers. Low Clotho um, had higher levels of, uh, of cancer rates. And then there was this uh, nadir and then uh, a slight increase as Clotho levels went higher and higher. So there's, uh, there's a lot that needs to be considered when we're looking at this. And, you know, I'm not a, a huge fan of the population-based studies because it, they haven't done a great deal for us over the years. I mean, you look at the, the top 10 prescribed drugs in the U.S., and I think you have to treat a minimum of four people to get one positive effect at the best of these top 10 prescribed drugs. And there, there just is not enough contextualization of how these interventions work on individuals. And so that's something that, um, that I have wanted to address for quite a while. 